telling you about the book gift program in, in the U.S. for elementary school students. If they read four books in a month uh, and they write a book report, then the teachers will give them a coupon and then they can go to I don't know if they're really, they're still doing it now, but this is when I was a kid. But, um, this is kind of a, those kind of retro t-shirt from before. So, all right, so the title I've read, I've um, uh, taken all the comments into consideration and uh, uh, had a look again at the, the literature and I've retitled my talk as the underrated role of context in second language incidental vocabulary acquisition through reading. Because I think the problem with the research before lies in the um, the underrated role of context, meaning that researchers are not taking a close enough look at how context can affect um, vocabulary acquisition. So, first of all, why is this an interesting uh, area, and why should this area of research be pursued? Well, one is not only for not only is it interesting to researchers to try to um, discover how and why um, learners of a language, whether it be first or second language, acquire vocabulary, um, but also because teachers uh, often spend a lot of time in their classrooms um, to teach vocabulary. So, if there is a way that we can, as teachers. Uh, somehow make it more efficient for the students, then this would be beneficial for the students. Or do we even need to spend as much time as we are now? So this is a question that needs to be explored. And also, it's important to second language learners because past research has shown that uh, second language learners spend a lot of time memorizing vocabulary, and they also feel that vocabulary is the most difficult thing for them to, to master. Uh, even very advanced learners in a second language still struggle with vocabulary. And um, some researchers have shown that even the methods that second language learners are using to learn, study and learn vocabulary are inadequate and at sometimes uh, even causing problems with their, their vocabulary learning. So we need to ask ourselves how much time should be invested in extensive reading? So how much that says a, from a language learner's point of view, as a researcher's point of view, also as a teacher's point of view. And right now, the research, the role of, has shown, hasn't really shown the role of that incidental vocabulary learning, the reading plays. So we, we still think it's quite unclear. We don't, we, we see the result, but we don't know anything about the process or about why this process occurs. Um, if you look on dictionary.com, they define a word a word as a unit of language consisting of one or more spoken sounds or the written representation uh, that functions as a principal carrier of meaning. A principal carrier of meaning, the most important part that's going to carry the meaning. Words are usually separated by spaces in writing and are distinguished phonologically as by accent in many languages. Okay? Um, basically here he's saying that, you know, a word is a series of letters on a page and it's separated by white space. So, so here this word or the, this word or is a word because it's letters connect to get together and there's space in between. So H and E here in this H and E, this specific H and E would not be considered a word because there's not enough white space on the side. So that's the definition of word here, basically. Um, my review of the past research revealed that a definition, or revealed a definition of word that ignores the fact that words, that often words that are separated by spaces in writing do not always fully function as a principal carrier of meaning. So the definition of word and the actual way that language works is quite different because Often, words work together in the form of language chunks to express a single unit of meaning. Sometimes, the individual parts don't tell us very much or anything at all, but together, we have a meaning. Okay? 
and I'll show you some examples later of these. Um, so the before mentioned uh, limited definition of word, how how this how that definition from dictionary.com it has it has been used by researchers and sent them on a path to try to figure out what is the number of exposures that we need for for of a target vocabulary before through reading incidentally through reading before a second language learner can learn this word okay they've taken this into consideration and tried to come up with an answer but unfortunately they just focused on individual one uh, series of letters that are separated by white space they didn't consider anything else besides this as being a word now, go back to the last one. There is a new word. Instead of the... Uh, quintessential. No, what is that? Quintessential it means the perfect number or the exact number you need. Oh, let me know what is the, the number of times I need to read this vocabulary and then I will learn it incidentally. So that's two words, right? Essential and quint. Yeah, quintessential. Yeah. Essential. So you know you will be able to guess it by essential. essential, yeah. Okay. So the body of research surrounding incidental vocabulary acquisition through reading has brought forth conflicting data. So um, they have all come up with different numbers, different quintessential numbers that you need to be of times you need to be exposed to a word through through uh, um, through reading before it can be acquired. And basically, if you sum up all the results of all the research, they've only been able to prove that learners can correctly answer multiple choice questions covering a certain percentage of target vocabulary. It's not really saying they really can learn any words, but if you look at what they're saying, they're saying, yes, they can answer a small percentage of multiple choice questions on vocabulary that appear within a given reading. Um, so what is the purpose of my presentation in my talk today. So I want to critically review and re-examine commonly accepted notions regarding the relationship between reading and incidental vocabulary acquisition. And I want to try to talk about why I think they have these conflicting results. And I will revisit a classic paper uh, to illustrate how repeatedly neglecting context in the, in the state of language chunks has caused this kind of conflicting data. And then I will conclude with some implications for future research into the field of incidental vocabulary acquisition. So when I give you the example, because of limited time, I will only give one example. But if you want to, if you want more, I can email you more examples. I'm still in the process of um, collecting that data. Okay, so a quick review. So uh, as I talked during the last talk, uh, the default argument is often cited as a reason for the unexplainable number of vocabulary that both first language and second language learners uh, acquire. And the default argument is that, well, the most of the vocabulary that we receive, I mean that we uh, learn, is learned incidentally and it's through language input, most likely reading, but it could be other things. And what is so surprising is these large vocabularies um, are acquired with little or no assistance from teachers. So students are becoming independent learners and, it's, and most people say, oh, it's most likely from reading. So that's why it's called the default argument. Um, so because of this argument that a, a researcher, a group of researchers decided they would try to um, test this and therefore they, they took a novel called A, a Clockwork Orange and this, uh, this novel is um, very valuable because it has a lot of made-up words inside the novel. So therefore, um, if the researchers wanted to give this novel to some learners and ask them to read it and test incidental vocabulary acquisition, they wouldn't have to worry about um, a pretext because to see whether the, the people reading the book knew the words or not, because all of the words are already made up and they're already inside of the already inside of the novel. And um, so what they decided to do was to take this 
this novel, give it to some um, some learners, let them read the novel, and tell them, oh, we're going to ask you to write a critical review of this novel. But in fact, after they were after they read the novel, they gave these learners a multiple choice test to see whether they had had learned. And yes, the, they did learn some a lot of the vocabulary, but what was so mind-boggling about the results was that sometimes that there may have been a vocabulary word that was inside the novel maybe 200 times or more, but very few people learned this word. Whereas there were other words that were in the novel only one time, and, the, and they were able to learn this word. So they kept, they felt, oh, this is, this is, very, this is very strange. Um, but the researchers said, oh, we think it's because of uh, context. We think, oh, maybe because the vocabulary is in context, and maybe something about the number of exposures. So this started a lot of other research, re researchers trying to figure out what is, that no what is the number of exposures needed, though? And why was this first study get, um, giving us such conflicting data? Uh, so far up to the, uh, this day, I haven't been able to find any study that has uh, been able to produce such a high percentage of vocabulary gain through a single, a single reading of an entire text. Okay, this is, I mean, through a single reading of an entire text. There have been some studies where researchers have asked students to repeatedly read the same text, which have brought forth pretty good results. Um, um, some people say, oh, this is because of the research methodologies. Um, and some say, oh, because of this first study, they use native speakers. They use native speakers as subjects, so that could also have something to do with it. But I still beg, uh, I still beg to differ with this. I still think it's another other reasons. So, but there were some things that were the same about these studies, which were the the vocabulary exposure, how they were, how learners were exposed to vocabulary, and the testing methodology. It was all the same. So they would all be given a complete text to read within a given um, time limit and that contained real second language vocabulary or made up vocabulary. And then they wouldn't know that they would be tested later. And the tests could be immediate, delayed, or both. So this is kind of a summary of what all of the studies have in common. Um, so also, even as I said before, they all had different results. Many of the studies were too uh, cautious to give a, a number of how many exposures are needed. But a few of the studies suggested 10. The original study I mentioned before suggested you need 10. Others said 8. Um, some didn't give, like for example, many of them gave this kind of response. They would say something like, oh, if you could, do, in this kind of situation, a learner is has a certain percentage of a possibility of learning a word, etc. But others gave number six, 25 to 30, or 10, 10 times. Um, many others that just gave answers similar to this, very, very safe answers, I think, without giving a, an exact number. So my critiques of the research are that um, they've just said that, oh, okay, they learners can learn vocabulary, but the but incidentally, but the gains are very low very long. And also some have said, some other researchers have said, oh, the, the assessment measures they've used are not good. Um, if you ask them just to translate a word, it doesn't show incremental learning of vocabulary. And others say, oh, if you, um, the vocabulary is a non-linear process, meaning you don't just learn a word and learn a word. Sometimes you learn a word, you forget it, and then you learn it again, you forget it again, and then you learn it, you know it for a long time, but then in the end you still forget it. So this research, these researchers have figured this out. And others point out the need that, uh, well, what is really learning? So far, it's, they're not really showing learning, they're showing what you can answer multiple choice questions. That doesn't really constitute learning. And others uh, talk about uh, post-test, that, does that qualify as a uh, valid enough reason to say that claim that learning has, has uh, taken place with vocabulary or, or maybe even the delay, 
um, process. And some have mentioned that we should really take into consideration the ability of the learners and are they ready to read such a text and does the amount of unknown vocabulary appear within this text, is it right for them? However, one, even though all of these flaws have been mentioned and, and future research have been controlled for, I think one very important attribute has been neglected time and time again, and um, I think that is uh, context, especially uh, language chunking. Okay. Besides the work of Webb, like the paper we read in the class, no other researcher has attempted to con concisely control the context in which target words appear. But um, I don't exactly agree with Webb's methods because uh, Webb, uh, I think he controlled for so much that it began not to even look like reading anymore. Students were just, they were reading sentences, yes, but it, it lost the the original spirit of these studies, which was giving students like a novel or a short story to read for fun, and then you just learn the vocabulary automatically. It didn't seem very fun to me, and it didn't seem like my idea of reading when you think the first thing you think of is reading. Um, there are some studies that do mention context, but their definition is simply that of the words uh, of the help that words surrounding target words can give a learner in guessing the meaning of the target word. So some do mention context, but they just talk about, oh, if I see this word simply, I can look at the words around it, and if I know those words, maybe those words around a single word can help me to guess the meaning. That's the, that's the definition of context they've used. And also, others have mentioned extra linguistic context. That's like verbalizing when reading, like reading aloud to help you to um, memorize the vocabulary, or reading a text with pictures, so you have not only the, you have other kinds of um, extra linguistic context. So very few studies have mentioned anything about context at all. But it has been a very limited, very limited view of context. Um, but I think one of the reasons is maybe why they have avoided this is if you're dealing with language chunks, chunks is going to present several difficulties. Uh, first, you have to isolate these chunks. And somehow you would have to be able to replace them. If we keep do, um, following the same methodologies as before, we would need to try to come up with some way to replace them with made up equivalents and then finally test the learners. And also, actually, you know, there's a lot of debate right now about what equals a language chunk. Yeah, so this is also a problem. But still, I think that there's been a lot of uh, strives in recent years uh, with natural language processing that can ease the edi editing of naturalistic text. And I think with computers, and that this should be the next step. And people should start doing this now. And uh, no matter, yes, it's difficult, but that's what research is for. It's not meant to be easy. Uh, so now I want to talk a little bit about language chunking and language acquisition. So uh, Nation, he describes language chunks as words that belong together, meaning that they commonly appear together, just words that belong together, meaning they, they you can see these words often together. Uh, here's an example, like take a break, okay? They appear together. The words take and the word break, they often appear, appear together. Or the meaning is not obvious from their individual parts. <coughs> For example, by the way, if you just look at these words individually, you cannot really grasp the meaning of the phrase by the way. So if you test this, if you test the word by in those kind of methodologies before, you're not getting a clear picture unless you test it by the way. So it's flawed. And Nation goes on to name three reasons why the notion of language chunking deserves uh, further attention. So he, says, he states that language knowledge is collocational knowledge. All fluent and appropriate language use requires collocational knowledge, and many words are used in a limited set of collocations, and knowing these is part of what is involved in knowing words. So you cannot really separate collocations and chunks. Here he's using it interchangeably. Collocate, for him, collocation means everything. It can be chunks, language patterns, everything. What he's trying to say is, um, there is a there is a method to the madness. You can see some kind of pattern in in a language, 
And it, if you don't follow this pattern, then uh, you're not going to be very native-like in your speech. And you're not going to be able to progress. It's like you're fighting against the system. So also, language learning cannot be trimmed down to learning individual vocabulary. But by learning vocabulary in relation to other vocabulary, you have to learn how certain vocabulary are related to other vocabulary and how they work together within the language. That will make it easier for you. And also this process of language, um, the process of learning language and how it naturally occurs is referred to language chunking. So sometimes we learn, we learn chunks of a language before we learn the individual words. And sometimes we learn individual words and then later find out, oh, this is part of a chunk. So um, Professor Weibel tells us that language chunking can occur in both directions. So it can be either way. It can be uh, from a chunk to the individual parts or from individual parts to the chunk. Usually uh, from the chunk to the individual parts is for native speakers, but often as non-native speakers of a language, most of our input is from written things, written text. So we don't know what is a chunk. We can only see, uh, we can only see the words on the page, but we don't know where it is chunk. If, if, if in, for example, if English is, isn't your native language. Also, just like for me, the first time I laid my eyes on a, on a paragraph in Chinese and I hadn't learned anything, I don't know where one word begins and where the next begins. Okay, so, and also it says, um, uh, the last point about chunking is, nation stress is that language chunking usually occurs where the same parts are often observed together. So when you can see things uh, often occurring together, you will know this is a chunk for sure. Okay, so this is my, this is my point. Knowing this, it would not be a large jump to state that vocabulary repeated repeatedly appearing in the same language chunk would be easier for learners to observe, chunk, and learn than those vocabulary repeated, uh, appearing in, uh, repeatedly appearing in different chunks. So for example, if you have a word and it appears in the novel, yes, maybe 200 times, but each time it's appearing in different chunks, meaning that it's surrounded by different words all the time. Maybe it will be more difficult for you to learn this word than you, if you learned another word that was appearing a, a similar number of times within the same novel, but it was appearing within a chunk, the same chunk each time that it appeared. That, that's, that's a point that, that, that I think that needs to be explored now. So past incidental vocabulary acquisition through reading research is as neglected to consider the role that chunking of a language may play in the acquisition of vocabulary. I'm saying that what we should do now is try to test this and see if it's really true or not. Okay, for example, the study before that I told you about the made up NANSAT words. Okay, like I said before, their study showed that some of the words were much easier for the learners to learn than others. And they said that, oh, maybe it's because of frequency of currents. But actually, if it was because of frequency, then there should be a clear number of occurrences that would be needed uh, before a, a learner would acquire that vocabulary. Instead, like I said before, sometimes the word appeared many times and the student didn't acquire it. But sometimes it appeared a few, uh, a small number of times and they were able to acquire it. Also, other studies that control for context were able to pinpoint exactly what and about context generated higher levels of incidental vocabulary acquisition. I think that accounting of frequencies of occurrence is just too simple of a thing to do. Language is very, we already know that language is very complex and very hard to understand. So this is too simplistic of a view. We need to look more deeply at, at language in order to understand how vocabulary is required. Um, so I propose that the NADSAT's words that appeared in the novel repeatedly in the same chunk will be easier for the learners to notice and thus acquire incidentally than those that appear in several different language chunks. I don't know if it's true or not. This is, this is my hypothesis. But to illustrate the point, I will show you an example of just um, one of these words that was tested 
uh, in the original study. Uh, the word is, the made up word is babushka, but babushka means old woman, and it occurred uh, 15 times in the novel. Okay, it occurred 15 times in the novel. So 10 of those uh, occurrences, they follow the pattern of an adjective plus old plus babushka. There was always an adjective, there was always <coughs> the word old and babushka. And actually, if you eliminate the word old, it would be 13, because then actually the pattern would become adjective and then babushka. Sometimes old and sometimes not. It's so almost all of the occurrences had the same language pattern. I don't know if you can see this clearly, but see, adjective plus old babushka, there's 10, and adjective plus babushka is, is 3. And then there were two more without this. So, for example, this would be the kind of pattern that I think uh, that would be easier for the learner to learn than one that had the word appearing in many, many, many uh, different patterns. It wouldn't be the same way. I don't have time to show those today, but I will. I can email you some as an example. So, of course, my my analysis for today is too simplistic because I cannot. I don't have time to show everything. But I think it's clear enough in my example that there's a need for more sophisticated computer processing of text um, that they use in incidental vocabulary position. They need to look more deeply at the text to determine what chunks are are inside these texts. And also they need to broaden their, their view and their definition of what is a word. Okay, so my, conclu my conclusion is that, okay, I can show in A Clockwork Orange, in the original study that started all of these, these um, other research studies, that this text contains language chunks. But I believe that not only this text, but all texts, of course, will contain language chunks. And um, I think we need to try to isolate and determine how chunking of a language fits into an overall theory of incidental vocabulary acquisition. Because right now, it's, this field is really lacking any type of theory because they cannot come up with any reason why, and it's very difficult to test. Um, I also think that learners, they should be given realistic and appropriate text and tasks because some of the task in some of these studies is not really realistic of real life readers and real life reading. And they're not given full, sometimes they're not given full text. Like the original study, the first one I read, they were given a novel. But later studies, sometimes they were just given sentences. It's kind of scattershot. It's not really like real reading. And they should have a, access to a choice. They should be able to choose naturalistic native speaker-like text that are self-motivating and at an appropriate level. Shouldn't be too difficult, shouldn't be too easy. And learners should be given ample time to freely read and enjoy them. That's what reading is all about. And they should be filled with opportunities to acquire real English words and language chunks that are slightly beyond the learner's current level. These are really basic language learning, um, a language uh, acquisition philosophies. Okay, so to test the effect of chunking on a language, um, we need to also develop better methods of assessment. Because some, if we want to look at um, maybe incremental, incremental knowledge of chunks, then we need to do more than just ask students to give a translation or just answer a multiple choice uh, question. Um, for example, the paper that I think we read was pretty good in giving ways, but I think the the way in which students were presented with the text and read was, was where there was problems. And also, um, Miria pointed out that there has been little attempt, like I said, to try to produce a model. There's no model right now of incidental vocabulary acquisition. So, but he, he gave an example of the germination of seeds, growing seeds. Um, he said that all they've been able to prove now is like, like Vocabulary words are like seeds. You take the seeds and you throw them in the ground and you cover them over, okay? And then some flowers will grow from the seeds. But not every seed will, will sprout and make a flower. So he's saying that's just the way they've been doing it with, um, with incidental vocabulary acquisition research. 
they take a lot of vocabulary words, they put it in in a, a text, and then test to see whether the students have learned these vocabulary words or not. And then, yes, they learn some of them, and some of them they don't, but we don't really know why. I think that just like um, uh, just like that all, all soil is not the same. All soil, when you throw seeds in the ground, some soil is better than others. And also I think it's kind of this, and it has different nutrients, right? And I think the same goes for text as well. I think that we need to start looking at the nutrients that are inside the text for these vocabulary. Trying to see what, are, what kind of chunks these, these uh, words are appearing in. And I think that can give us a, a better idea about uh, developing a theory and also about what's taking place um, with learners learning uh, second language vocabulary incidentally through reading. So I think that future research in the field of incidental learning of uh, vocabulary should be attempting to accomplish two goals. One should be to construct and build upon a theory or model of second language incidental vocabulary acquisition that is, does not exclude other possible definitions of word such as language chunks or language patterns. And two, by isolating, isolating and constructing research studies that look at new factors that may influence the rate of incidental acquisition of target words. Just stop doing the same thing over and over again and do something, do something new. Thank you. Questions, comments? I know I talked really fast, but I wanted to finish. Did I kind of answer your question from last week, Cindy? Or not last week, but the last time I presented? Uh, I'm not really sure what, what question you want to answer. Why I criticize those studies before. Oh, especially with their writing. 
Yeah. Because, um, or if you give them something to read mm -hmm. in which there contains chunks or collocation, then you ask them to write a summary or this kind of thing, and you can see, like, there. Are, I think there are other ways that you can control and try to test, but I think it's more difficult and it will be harder to get uh, the research community to accept it. Mm -hmm. But I think it's getting, it's getting better. And whether on the computer or not, I think both is okay. I think it does, for me, um, I, I still think it's okay to use a book. Okay. Yeah, but some people, you know, yeah, your computer has the other, other ideas you have to think about and you have to consider. But for me, what I'm still, I, I still think I'm interested in just, you know, a piece of paper or a text because I think uh, just from doing some interviews with a lot of, uh, with students, I still think mo a majority of students, they still try to print their papers and those kind of things that they, they want to read. They still make a printout. But I suggest computer if you could record the time, the yeah. time and uh, the repeatness of reading to yeah. so make it more natural. So you have a record of how many times did the reader go through the books. Yeah. yeah. And then do you consider like the beginner, like for example, with the uh, grade one or two students? They just started to learn English. So, yeah. so there is, uh, I mean, the what? The pretest will be a lot easier. Oh, maybe, yeah. Mm -hmm. But um, but I think also with them, well, with, with <coughs> younger kids, it may, yeah, it's a different kind of mm -hmm. idea. But I think for me, I'm really, I'm still really interested in adult, adult learners. I think they need a lot of help more than than kids. <laughs> kids are so easy to learn the language; they just absorb it. You know? mm -hmm. If you surround them with the environment and give them enough input, they're yeah. they're so good. But you know, when you're when you're an adult, you're using whatever part of your brain that can <laughs> that can help you to learn the language, and you're still struggling. Yes. So I think if there's a way to make it. Uh, easier for for learners. I I hope I can help. It's impossible. You cannot learn every word. <laughs> Uh, uh, let's let's let me think about the the example we mentioned. The main maybe that's our is China. Mm -hmm. I think that would be an example about the incidental learning vocabulary. Just like we don't need to check the meaning, and maybe we touch this word first time, we can catch the meaning, hold hold the meaning. I think maybe it's a, a kind of example about the incidental learning in Chinese. I think. I think and the, all, all of in our first language, most of the words we learn have to be. And uh, if it is true, I think counter frequency would be meaningless in this issue. Yeah. Well, what they were trying, yeah, it's meaningless, but what they were trying to do is they were trying to say, oh, I want to know through reading. And if they've never been exposed to this word ever before, they wanted to just try to find out, well, what is the total number they need to be exposed to? That way, maybe we can just develop some reading materials for students and include the, the top uh, 3,000 vocabulary that they need. And you just can just give them books, and they can just keep reading stories. And then we don't need to teach students yeah. the vocabulary. We can teach them grammar and those other things that are harder. And we can teach them writing, but we don't need to teach the vocabulary anymore. I think that was maybe that's one idea, mm -hmm. but yeah, it's, there's a lot of research about those graded readers. I told you how they will write the same story at many different levels using more and more words and more difficult words. I think that was one of the reasons, and to try to see should we keep doing this kind of thing or or not.
Uh, I, I guess, uh, maybe I'm wrong. So some issue or your experiment design maybe can combine with what Jian Zhe mentioned today. Because he ever mentioned some rules about we understanding a word. It's a kind of... Um, his is about individual words, but I'm about uh, uh, the pattern in, not in the word, but the pattern in within like a, a chunk. Yeah, but probably morphological awareness will play a yeah. role. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, we will write a paper. Yeah, you do. Uh, it just reminds me that in Harry Potter, there are lots of uh, made up names. Yeah, the, a lot of words are made up, but they have um, connotations. Oh, okay. I don't know about the Chinese version, but I'm. I'm reading the, the, no Engli the English versions mm -hmm. now. Actually, I'm on the last book. Don't tell me what happens. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to say that first. Don't tell me what happens. Because I'm only halfway through the first book. I mean, the last book, the last book. Mm -hmm. but, um, but all of those magical terms, they are very, they have some, you can tell what they mean, a lot of them. Yeah. Like, voluminous. Like it's like illuminate to light up, mm -hmm. and every time they say this, then their wand will have a light. Yeah. How about in Chinese? Does no, the translator do it? No, no meaning. Like they the, just the, the name of the school. What is that? Hogwarts. 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 Hogwarts yes. The in Chinese just hago. 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 So it's just a sound. Mm -hmm. Just a sound. But. If we think of, if I think of Hogwarts, I would think of hogs, yeah. Yeah? and I would think of warts, like the, yeah, warts. like the thing on your, you can get on your finger. That's morphological, but that's what I'm trying. And I think that it's a, I think it's a, it was a, I don't know about the word hog, but I think maybe the word warts it was used. She was making a joke because people in Western tradition. We usually say that witches have a lot of warts on their mm -hmm. fingers, their nose, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. this kind of thing. So I think she was poking fun at this kind of um, view of witches, mm -hmm. this kind of thing, like a stereotype of witches. Okay. So when you talk about comprehension, probably that is a way to test. Children enjoy that book, yeah. Harry Potter, but do they really dig into the meaning of? Um, there is a, one study I read. They they were talking about. Uh, they were talking. They talk. They discussed this issue, and they said the researchers said, "Oh, maybe that the reason that the vocabulary learning was so low is because the students just ignored those mm -hmm. words they yeah. didn't know. Mm -hmm. Because why? They were interested in the story. They just wanted to know what is happening next. What is happening next? So it's also a possibility too. Yes. But if that's true. Then, yeah. if they say this kind of thing, I thought, well, you're going against your whole study because you're talking about incidental vocabulary acquisition. You don't want them to pay attention to the mm -hmm. to the word. So it depends on the task demand. Yeah. You just you know, do the comprehension or get the vocabulary. Oh, it's a different story. Yes. Mm -hmm. oh. But I think it's I'm, very difficult for you to know. <laughs> yeah, it's very difficult. To do the to okay. do this kind of uh -huh. to do this kind of thing, but I will try. I guess. Yes, yes, yeah, yes. That's, that's why we need research. But I but um yeah, it's really hard. I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank, Thank you, you everyone. Okay. Uh, we're next week. 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 We're next